Hi, Thank James. Uh, welcome to UCI. Lovely Thank to have you. you here. Yeah, very pleasure. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah. yeah, great to have this great EV company <laughs> right in our backyard mm -hmm. uh, and all the cool work that you're doing. So can you explain your role a little bit at Rivian? Uh, mm -hmm. You're heading the autonomy group. Yep. Yeah. What so, does day-to-day -day look like? Uh, in, uh, yeah. Yeah, so my, my team is mostly responsible for the, the autonomy features on the vehicle. So we kind of think of those in two, two main buckets. So one is the active safety features on the vehicle. So that's like lane keep assist and automatic emergency braking, so AEB. And then the driver convenience features. So the kind of the highest level of that is what we call highway assist. And that is, you know, taking control of the vehicle from you, steering and uh, keeping distance from other traffic. So yeah, those are the two areas. I think sort of clicking down a level, um, when you think about the vehicle being, having one of these autonomy modes engaged, it's really a robotic agent in the world, right? So it's perceiving its surroundings using cameras and radars, trying to understand all the agents, how they're moving. It's sort of predicting the near future. So is that vehicle gonna cut in front of me? Um, and then it's building a plan. So how do I you know, plan to move this robot through the world in a way that it's, it's getting closer to its destination? And then finally executing. So sending the commands, the vehicle actuation commands. So um, when you think about those sort of four buckets, you know, we're using ML mm. and AI in almost all of those. Um, I think uh, it's a very sort of data-driven machine learning. And, you know, I would call it, you know, specialized AI these days because, you know, uh, ChatGPT has kind of opened up that space so, mm. much, so much bigger. Um, in terms of kind of North Star products, um, I always think about, you know, the drive to Tahoe from, from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really boring drive, right? It's like three hours. It's all on highway and freeway. Um, and I think having that essentially be fully autonomous would be fantastic. Um, and then I think, uh, I think for the industry in, uh, in general, I think there's a huge um, opportunity for more active safety features. Like if you look at the latest NHTSA accident reports in North America, they've actually started moving up, um, mm -hmm. so moving in the wrong direction. Um, I think you know, when you dig into those, you know, what is happening in those cases, I think there's a huge room for, for improvement there through, mm -hmm. through better technology. So I think it's actually, we need to deploy this technology faster, in my opinion. That's very interesting, James. <clears throat> so what is Rivian's vision for this? Where do, will we have self-driving, fully self-driving car anytime soon? Is the assist feature the more important vision to be driving towards right now? Where do you think Rivian is laying its bets? Yeah, I think, I think right now we're focused on, you know, providing value to our, to our customers. And I yeah. think those is, is a lot around you know, letting you drive when you want to drive, when it's yeah. exciting to drive. You know, yeah. um, the adventurous nature is a big part of the Rivian brand. But you know, when the driving is boring, when it's monotonous, um, I think the technology is there now that you shouldn't have to do those those miles. Um, and yeah. I think then making the vehicle safer for for you, for your passengers, and for you know other agents outside in the world is mm -hmm. is a big goal. That's very interesting. So you know, I think I I think really about companies like Rivian and Tesla are being very, very different fundamentally than older OEMs. Mm -hmm. Like I think we were talking about Mercedes earlier, Toyota, Honda. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how are these companies different? Are they different or not? Mm -hmm. How are they different? Uh, and how do you see this difference playing out in the next 10 years, for example? Yeah, I, I think it's tough for the traditional OEMs. So I think, um, you know, the, the audience may, may not may or may not be familiar with like how the tiering model works in automotive but if you buy a ford today you're actually you know ford is putting a lot of different components that it's you know sourced from different suppliers so uh, you know certain things ford will build but a lot are actually brought in from other tier ones so things like you know, places like conti magna bosch tier two is like mobileye and others so you know, for Ford to ship a new feature or to do things like OTA, you know, for them, it's really this, this huge integration effort talking to all these different suppliers. The suppliers have their own business models mm -hmm. that, you know, they have their own timelines. And it's just sort of like herding cats, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons you see um, the traditional automakers really struggle with right. this sort of software-defined vehicle push. And, you know, consumers are now starting to expect these regular updates where you get new yeah. features and, and um, you know, better experience in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, as an example, uh, you know, Rivian, so we actually own and build all the software for almost all the ECUs on our vehicle, and we can actually uh, over the air update them every month. So last month we shipped a new feature in, uh, which improves the ride handling of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
And it's actually a really dramatic change. Like when I first tried it, I was like, you know, it's almost like being in a new vehicle. Um, it's very smooth yeah. and you know, great, great uh, ride handling. And I think, you know, that that is that that involved all this coordination from the drive modules, the steering to you know so many different systems. And that's the kind of thing that's really enabled by a software-defined vehicle, right. and something that you know the traditional uh, OEMs really struggle with. Yeah, that's why. That, thanks for making that point. I think that's very interesting. And you know, I, I don't have a Rivian, I have a Tesla, but you know, every month you sort of have yet, a new car. Yes, yet, 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 yes, <laughs> yes. So maybe the test drive today will yeah, help we'll, me make we'll, that we'll, decision. We'll uh, so I think w one thing that you said is very interesting is you know you can do these OTAs and over the air at bits uh, so that you can push features. Your car is improving over time, mm -hmm. which is very difficult for traditional uh, car makers to do. Now, if you overlay this with what you said earlier, right, about think about self-driving, you're learning from all of this data. The car really needs to keep learning all parts. Data from all parts needs to keep coming together. Can you talk a little bit about how both these worlds come together, right, from a physical hardware perspective, or mm -hmm. how the, the supply chain has been structured, and how much of that actually speaks to can you do AI <coughs> machine learning as a core part of the product or not? Yeah, it's interesting, and I think you know I see a pattern in hardware-centric businesses where you know they kind of treat the the end goal as being the, the ship date, right? So you know there's all this mechanical work, harnesses, um, you know, electrical design, mm -hmm. and then you hit the launch and you're done. You move on to the next thing. But software and AI systems are not like that, right? So software you continually need to um, adapt it, to invest in it, to test it, to maintain it. And so, you know, the software, the, li the lifetime of the software has to be for the full lifetime of the product. And I think this is doubly so with AI systems. So um, the case I always think about is uh, the introduction of electric scooters in, in urban areas. So, you know, if you bought a, an ADAS system before, you know, about 2015, there would essentially be no electric scooters in the training data for that system. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a sort of performance decay you get if you're not updating these systems over time. Um, right. You know, the quality of the ADAS is actually going to go down because the world is changing and you're not adapting yeah. the system to the world. So I think it's, yeah, you really have to, I think, deeply embed this um, continual improvement mindset that mm -hmm. the product is product is, ne is never done. It always needs to be improved. Yeah. Very interesting, right? So I think the product is never done. It keeps improving over time. Very different from even standard software practices where mm -hmm. you ship a product, it's done. How do you think about building the culture? I think Vijay talked about this. It's a very different culture, very different mindset. How do you go about building that team? Who do you bring on to the team? How do you scale up that team? Yeah, I think the first thing to recognize is that um, ML development is not the same as software development, yeah. right? So, you know, and I, I see this, this tension all the time, actually, with um, people trying to apply sort of software development processes to ML development. Um, so I think the first thing to recognize with with you know, machine, developing machine learning models is it's primarily an experimental activity. So it's hard to predict in advance you know, what change to the model, change to the data, what the outcome will actually be. You may have some intuitions, and if you get really great you know, ML engineers, they'll, their intuitions will be right more often than not. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, the, the, a successful ML organization really deeply sort of empowers engineers to run experiments quickly and get good results. So that means Focusing on data, so data quality, data scale, um, data variety. You know, is the data matching, uh, you know, the, the environment in which the product's going to be deployed? Do you have the right metrics and KPIs? So can you measure success? Can you um, see how close you're getting to, to to the goals? And then can you enable this rapid experimentation and then tracking of experiments? Um, and so that's sort of, sort of both a technical thing. It's also a cultural thing. Right? If you have, you know, often see sort of TPMs come in. And they're like, oh, when's the model going to be done? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you know, ML engineer might say, well, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to try all these things, and you'll have to see how the performance does. And I think it's like there's a, there's a kind of mindset shift that organizations have to undergo um, to kind of get into that, that way of thinking. Okay. And then in terms of, um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of how to run the organization, I often think, um, you know, I had some friends who were, uh, organic chemists when I was uh, doing my PhD at, o at Oxford. And the way that organic chemistry labs is, is run is actually very similar, I think, to how ML development mm -hmm. can happen, right? So 
you, you don't really know the outcome until you try the thing. So you have to really document experiments well. You have to manage multiple experiments in parallel. You have to, yeah, and then document the results and then really sort of glean the insights from those results. So I think, you know, organic chemistry labs, if you see a well-organized one, they'll have lab books going back 20 years. You could pick out a lab book and see an experiment um, that was run, you know, 15 years ago. So I think that level of process and diligence around experimentation is very important. So how do you, so it's an experimental science, and I think, you know, when you talk to folks in the industry around, mm -hmm. we're doing this experiment, we don't know what's the outcome, how do you do stakeholder management in that situation, right? How do you communicate the value of what you're doing when it's so uncertain to the CEO of the company, the board of the company? I mean, it should be measurable in your end-to-end -end outcomes, right? I, I think if it isn't, then like, either you're not measuring correctly, yeah. or maybe you're, you've not integrated the, the model and the product correctly, uh, or maybe it's just not providing enough value, right, to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the overall goal. So I think spending time to really define the success criteria and the evaluation criteria yeah. is very important. But I think there has to be a sort of recognition of um, this is not the same as you know getting a Jira task that takes one week and you know you do it and then the the feature's done. Um, mm -hmm. This there's a certain elasticity to how long these things can take. Um, okay. Yeah. So having like maybe a portfolio approach where some things are working. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think try multiple things in parallel and you know you can you can launch with the things that are working right now and and then keep keep the organization moving. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think James brings up a very great point that. You know, it's experimental. We should not be evaluating machine learning projects as we evaluate software projects. And so having, there will be some level of ambiguity as we mm -hmm. assess the success or failure of these things. Uh, now, as someone who has been, this is like core machine learning, like the kind of stuff that you're mm -hmm. doing at Trivia's core machine learning. <clears throat> How do you define success from, not from a business perspective, from, but from a technical perspective? When, you, when are you done? Are you ever done? Uh, how do you go and test these systems? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very deep topic in, in you know, autonomous driving, obviously. I think, um, you, you know, one of the ways you can measure this is um, uh, by, you know, having a lot of scenarios that you can run. So I think there's sort of several key ingredients to doing this. So, you know, one is a really good simulation system. So you can replay your stack through a scenario, um, but ideally offline, right? And I think, um, being able to do that in scale in the cloud um, can give you this, these sort of insights of a large scale, which mm. you wouldn't get from just a test or you know, shipping on a few vehicles. And um, so I think that's one piece. I think one is having clear sort of evaluation criteria, and, that, mm -hmm. and there could be a lot of work there. So it isn't super clear how to define you know, good driving behavior. Right? You can say the simple things like you know, don't collide with things, um, drive smoothly. But within that envelope, there is an enormous array of um, you know, driving styles. Mm -hmm. So you know, how, to, how to kind of hone in your evaluation is, is, a, is a deep topic. And then I think the, the final piece is um, yeah, just having that mindset of sort of continual improvement um, and sort of embedding that in, the, in the, the organization. I think as well for us in the autonomous driving space, we can also look at human relative performance and yeah. use human relative miles as sort of a benchmark which you can evaluate yourself. I know that's not always possible in every industry. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think there is a world which has humans driving cars mm -hmm. and cars driving themselves. How does the world change when all cars are driving themselves? Is it an easier world? Is it a more difficult world to solve for from a machine learning AI perspective? I, I think in some ways it's potentially a little easier in the sense that you know, other vehicles can be more predictable. But I think you still have to, you know, deal with, you know, the dog running across the road, the humans, you know, jaywalking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, you know, so if you drive through San Francisco, you're going to see all sorts of weird and wonderful behavior um, that you <laughs> kind of need to need to capture in your models and capture in your systems. And I don't think having everything just be autonomous actually solves that, right? You still have yeah. to deal with the variety of the real world. Yeah. Right. How difficult it is to take these systems to production. I think that's a very important issue, especially in this setting. Like, yes, yeah. you know, it has to be very close to perfect. We had this discussion on chat GPT. If mm -hmm. it is wrong half the time, doesn't change anything much. Uh, for yeah. a lot of the use cases, but in this, in this case, it does matter a lot. Right, yeah. And I think it's interesting to me the parallels between you know, the self-driving domain and what's happening in large language, large language models. So I think um, you know, self-driving, 
you know, if you go back to 2010 even, um, there were some extremely impressive demos people were, were doing. And I think you, you could go on one of those demo drives and think, wow, this technology is here. It's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but actually, it's sort of 12 years later and many billions of dollars. And just now is, mm -hmm. you know, Cruise and Waymo are now you know, have a service that is operating in San Francisco. So the gap between the impressive demo and an actual product that shipped was, was very, very large. And I see something similar happening in large language models, right? So mm -hmm. I think um, these systems are very impressive, and you can, you can build demos, really impressive demos, like faster than ever, right? You can use Langchain and um, the, the things like Streamlit and all the online tooling is really, mm -hmm. really fantastic for getting a quick demo going. But I think, you know, when you think about these systems being sort of autonomous agents in the world, and I'll give you an example. I was reading about a startup um, that wants to have an LLM-based travel agent. And you know, I think that's that's great. But imagine that you know one flight in ten that this travel agent books is wrong, right? That's like very very annoying. I think so. I think the the bar for accuracy and consistency um, for these systems, especially in an autonomous, fully autonomous setting, is actually very high. And I think what that means is that this LLM needs to be embedded in a larger system that is you know controlling it and adding a bit more regularity. I also think it probably means that the LLM needs to be fine-tuned on the task right. over time, because I think you'll, you'll reach a point where you're trying to push into the long tail of your product, and you know, prompt engineering and you know, band-aids at the end is not going to get you there. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's huge promise. And I think, you know, especially in these domains where I think the LLM is more of an assist, and mm. I think that's ready today, right? So I think yeah. we're, we're using it a lot for code assist. Code assist um, and there you have like an expert software engineer that's using you know, something like ChatGPT as a you know, mm. code assistant, essentially. And the benefit there is you still have the, the expert to check the output, to review the code, but it's sort of like an accelerant. And I think um, anyone who's managing software teams today, you, know, you really need to enable these tools for your developers because yeah. uh, I think it's really a game changer. And it's actually it's ready today yeah. um, for many of these tasks. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, James. Yeah. I think we have... Couple of minutes for a few quick questions.